today's event is the fourth in this six part series we've been doing with UC Press. It's focusing on urgent societal issues from immigration to fascism, mass incarceration, coerced labor, climate change, and black labor in the making of America. The series is called UC Press Now, Urgent Conversations, hosted by Booksmith, and it continues for the next two Mondays at 11 a.m. Pacific time. Uh, it's been really excellent so far, and I'm excited for today's event. So thank you all uh, again for joining us. We're here with Erin Hatton to discuss her book, Coerced, Work Under Threat of Punishment. <clears throat> A little bit about the book. Um, prison laborers, graduate students, welfare workers, and college athletes are all part of a growing workforce of coerced laborers. Coerced explores this world of coerced labor through an unexpected and compelling comparison of these four groups of workers for whom a different definition of employment reigns supreme. One where workplace protections do not allow, uh, do not apply and employers wield expansive punitive power far beyond the ability to hire and fire. Because such arrangements are common across the country, Hatton argues that coercion, as well as precarity, is a defining feature of work in America today. Aaron Hatton is Associate Professor of Sociology at the University of Buffalo. A couple of house items before we get started. Um, you're muted, obviously, but I encourage you to show Aaron some love in the chat. Um, also, if you have anything you'd like to ask uh, throughout the program, please do that in the chat, um, as we'll have time for Q&A at the end of the program. Um, we invite you to turn your videos on if you'd like. Um, we'd love to see your faces. And um, uh, in the chat, um, we have a one strike policy. Uh, please, no hate speech or trolling. Um, if we see any of that, we will remove you uh, from the event and you won't be able to get back in. So um, don't do that to yourself. And um, uh, finally, if you'd like to order a copy of course, you can do that through Booksmith. I'll drop the link uh, for the book into the chat shortly. Uh, that's it for me. Uh, thank you all so much for being here. And Erin, um, congratulations on the book. Hi, thank you so much. Thanks for that introduction. Thanks to everyone showing up today. Um, this is a weird and wonderful, well, and sometimes horrific world that we live in at this moment. Um, so yeah, so as Evan noted, in this book here, this is it. In this book, whoops, my virtual screen is trying to hide it from you. I make this really unlikely comparison between four very, very different groups of workers. So I look at prisoners, um, many of whom are compelled to work behind bars. They typically do the work that keeps the institution running, like cleaning up the dorms, cutting the lawns, painting the facility, serving the food. I compare them to welfare recipients who are required to work in order to receive their public assistance. Typically they work for 25 or 35 hours a week, often kind of in menial picking up trash types of jobs. I compare those two groups to college athletes, specifically division one football and basketball players, as well as graduate students in the sciences who labor in their advisors labs as part of their PhD education. Now, Right at the outset, let me say here that I don't claim that these workers are the same in virtually any way, right? I'm not suggesting that graduate students are prisoners. That would be absurd. Um, but I do argue that they experience a similar type of labor coercion, right? In type, but not intensity. So just as um, day laborers experience economic coercion, they need their wages to survive, just as middle level managers or upper level managers also experience that type of coercion, they experience it to very, very different degrees. And so the same is true of graduate students on the one hand and prisoners on the other. They experience the same type of coercion, but not to the same degree. And they are clearly not equally vulnerable and marginalized or advantaged and privileged. Okay, but first, before I jump into the book, I want to step back and begin with a quote from Apache. And I should say here that all of the names in this book were chosen by the workers themselves so that they could identify themselves in my work. Um, and uh, I'll start with a quote from Apache as he described prison labor. Um, so like all able-bodied prisoners in New York State, Apache was required to work in prison. He worked six hours a day in the mess hall, preparing and serving food, washing dishes and scouring the kitchen, for which he was paid 15 to 17 cents an hour, nearly $13 every two weeks. Earning these wages in prison, Apache said, quote, you convince yourself that you're in a good position as far as, you know, getting by. Because you locked down, you ain't got to pay no light bills and this, that and the other. But it's still slave labor at the end of the day. 
because you don't get to call off, you don't get sick days, you don't get a union, you don't get none of the benefits of a normal worker. You can't really even advance. You can't aspire to be the boss one day. And I mean, you're getting paid 15 cents an hour, end quote. Yet, as I go on to write, even as Apache described prisoners' work as, quote, slave labor, he argued that it should not be otherwise. Prisoners should not earn the higher wages and other, quote, benefits of a normal worker, he said, because the purpose of prison labor is punishment. As he said to me, it's not supposed to be a camp. It's not supposed to be a happy place. We're in prison. We're not supposed to come in and kick our feet up. I mean, I think the best thing is to stay out of prison. I couldn't really conjure somebody getting a lot of money working in prison. It wouldn't really make sense to me. I mean, you're in prison. People are paying taxes and you're not doing nothing. I mean, like even my wife and my mom, they're out there working and they were sending me money and that didn't make me feel good. And if you really look at the grand scheme of things, you, indicating me, you were out there working for me to take care of me. I mean, the tax they took out of your check, they put it somewhere and somewhere down the line, it came in the prison. So my best advice, even though I am an advocate for prisoners and I don't wanna sound like a hater, but just don't go. If you don't wanna be put in that position, then don't go. Now, whether or not one agrees with Apache's view of prisoners and their labor, his description of their labor captures their contradictory position as workers in American society, right? On the one hand, they are slave labor. And in fact, they are the sole exception to the constitutional ban on slavery in the US, right? Prisoners can be forced to work, to be slaves. Um, and yet, they are also seen as doing nothing sitting in prison, being lazy, while other people are out there working for them, paying taxes. I think this quote from Apache captures a number of important themes that I talk about in my book. Foremost, kind of at the basis of it all, is the cultural importance of work. Right? This is a primary source of being a productive person, being a contributing member of society, being a dignified person of respect, and also the cultural disdain for laziness and idleness. Whether, kind of regardless of how much labor you do, if you are seen as lazy, that is fundamentally bad. And then also, as Apache notes, prisoners kind of unique position at the intersection of, on the one hand, slave labor, and on the other hand, doing nothing, not being contributing members of society, not fulfilling the obligations of productive citizenship, I guess, paying taxes, even though they're working and they're working all the time. And as a result of both of these dynamics, right, on the one hand, they can be compelled to work, but on the other hand, they're seen as lazy and not contributing and dependents. Prisoners, despite their labor, do not qualify for any of the basic rights that are attached to work in America, right? They don't get a minimum wage, they don't get overtime, they don't get workers' compensation or unemployment insurance, they don't have the right to organize and bargain collectively. And in fact, this is true for all of the workers that I analyze in this book. They don't get these rights, right? They are not legally recognized as workers under the law, not workfare workers, the welfare recipients, not athletes, not graduate students. Yet their exclusion from this category of worker is really the starting point of my analysis, not its end point. Because I set out to study these various groups of workers who are not protected by labor and employment laws. And through my interviews with more than 120 of these workers, I discovered that the dynamic that most immediately shaped their labor relations was not their exclusion from labor and employment protections per se, though that is also important, but really what shaped their labor, their, their experience of working was the power that their bosses wielded over them. For in these workplaces and all of them, their bosses, their corrections officers, their caseworkers, their coaches, and their faculty advisors, they hold expansive and often punitive power over these workers. And so for the remainder of this talk, I'll go through each of these four groups and I'll read a quote from some of the workers from my book to explain the power dynamics under which they labor. So in prison, for example, if incarcerated workers do not comply with virtually any demand from their bosses, and that really can be anything, including let's say if you're picking up trash on the walkway and a corrections officer, they're also called a CO, 
a CEO is mad or wants to put you down or whatever, and he'll make you strip down to your boxers and pick up trash on the walkway. If you do not comply with any order for any reason, you can face a number of punitive consequences. The lowest level is that you'll be, uh, you'll be issued a ticket. This is basically a fine, usually it's $5, um, which doesn't seem like too bad, except for the fact that $5 is a lot behind bars. And even more importantly, it means that you may not qualify for a parole for good behavior because catching too many tickets means you're not a good prisoner. Prisoners can also be put on keep lock. This means they have, they're locked, confined to their cell, and they lose all of the privileges, or really their basic human entitlements that become privileges behind bars. So they can't purchase food from the commissary. They can't have phone calls from their family. They may not be able to go to the library. They can't go to recreation and so on. And then often, and the harshest consequence that they face, is solitary confinement. This is being in a, put in a, an enclosed and segregated cell for 23 hours a day without human interaction. There are no limits on how long prisoners can be kept in solitary confinement. Um, although bioethicists say that any time past 15 days is torture because people are social beings. It is torture to be kept in solitary confinement. And yet this is a routine consequence for people behind bars. This is the type of power that their bosses wield over them, and it's very routine power indeed. So Garcia, one of the um, former prisoners that I interviewed, um, sorry, let me find it. This, as this 27-year-old Black and Hispanic man explained, the worst thing about working while incarcerated, I would have to say, is, well, pretty much being forced. You're forced to do that work. It's up to you whether you don't look at it as that, but at the end of the day and at the beginning of the day, you're forced to do all that. Like you have no say so. Either you do it or you go into the box. That's solitary. No, either you do it or get or you get your ass whooped and then you go to the box. So it's really like they rule with an iron fist. You can rebel, but there's still gonna be the same result. Now, in Garcia's understanding, as this quote makes clear, and, and for all the formerly incarcerated workers I interviewed, they all believed and experienced that any form of noncompliance or any misdeed could land them in solitary confinement. And many of the prisoners I interviewed had experienced it firsthand. For instance, OTI, he recounted several instances in which he was put in the box because he would not clean up bodily fluids. He refused to do such job, he explained to me, because he had not been trained in biohazard cleanup, although some of the other incarcerated workers in his institution had been trained for that, he had not. As he said to me, I was asked to clean urine and feces off a floor. I found that inappropriate and I suggested that they find someone that's in that area of biohazard cleanup. You know what I'm saying? Because of the HIV. Sometimes they ask us to clean up blood from another inmate, which is very hazardous, and they just give us some tissue and some infector and say, here, clean this up. In that instance, when he refused um, an officer's direct order, OGI said that he got a $5 ticket and was put in solitary confinement. Quote, if you refuse an order, you can go to the box. So I got a ticket for refusing an order and I went to the box in that situation, but I guess they seen the situation and they let me out in a week. They gave me a break. I could have been in there for 30 days. And most often the incarcerated people, formerly incarcerated people that I interviewed said that 30 days was the most common length of time for routine infractions. But unlike OTI, Bruce, another formerly incarcerated person I interviewed, did not get such a break when he refused to clean feces as part of his porter job. Quote, I mean, we're just talking about feces, the 23-year-old African-American man said with disgust. I'm not going to clean no feces. I don't care what gloves you give me. As a consequence, Bruce said that he was put in solitary confinement for 30 days, as he was on another occasion when he refused to clean the chewing tobacco that an officer had spit on the floor. Quote, the other incident I didn't want to clean, he recalled, was in a rowboat station that oversees the unit. The CO who worked there was nasty. He used to chew snuff and then he spit it on the floor and he expects people to clean it. I wasn't cleaning that stuff. Once again, Bruce said, he went to the box for a month. These are the types of power dynamics that incarcerated people live 
with and work under while they're working behind bars, being sent to the box for any infraction. Now in workfare, again, these are welfare recipients who are compelled to work um, in order to receive their public assistance, their cash benefits, their Medicaid, their food stamps, their rent and utility vouchers, their transportation assistance, their childcare assistance. If they do not comply with virtually any demand from their boss, that's either their workfare supervisor, their on-site supervisor, and or their caseworker, they can be sanctioned, that is cut off from all of their social assistance programs or cash benefits or rent vouchers and so on, all of the programs which are essential to families in poverty. And although such sanctions are usually temporary, right, the first offense might be 30 days, the second offense might be 60 days. Although the sanctions are usually temporary, their consequences are permanent. They reduce welfare recipients' lifetime allotment of public assistance, right? I don't know if you remember from the 90s with the approval of TANF, that's a big welfare law. Um, welfare recipients were given 60 months, five years to receive, over the course of their lives, to receive public assistance. When you're sanctioned, your 60 month clock, as they called it, keeps ticking, but you don't get any benefits. So they reduce your lifetime allotment of benefits. And of course, there are harsh and very long term lasting consequences for extreme poverty, the extreme hardship that results from being totally cut off. For instance, a number of people that I talked to um, ended up homeless and on the streets with their children as a result of sanctions, or as one uh, former workfare worker I interviewed said, that in New York City, if you were already living in a homeless shelter and you were sanctioned by the system, you would be kicked out of the homeless shelter. Now, nearly half of the 43 workfare workers I interviewed had been sanctioned at least once, and a significant minority of them had been sanctioned multiple times. Yet all of them described the seemingly ubiquitous threat of sanctions. As 33, a 30-year-old Shara White said to me, that's their favorite. Yep, that's their favorite. They're always trying to throw that they're going to sanction you in your face. Now, for Pauline Wilson, let me find my quote. <clears throat> for Pauline Wilson, it was this pervasive and very real threat of sanctions in combination with a persistent mistreatment that led her to defy her supervisor and relinquish her right to public assistance altogether. Although at the time of our interview, this 57-year-old African-American woman was working in a women's shelter, several years ago, she had been a workfare worker. First, she was assigned to clean up at a nonprofit organization, and then she was assigned to pick up trash on the side of a rural highway. Pauline said that she did not actually mind the work. Indeed, she believed that she had an obligation to work for her public assistance but she detested the ill treatment that seemed to come along with it. As Pauline explained, quote, some people didn't make it after the first week because they couldn't take it. They said, you let them talk to you like that? And then some people, they would cry, well, I need this money. But if you're not cut out for that kind of stuff, that kind of humiliation is not gonna work. And there's nobody cut out for that. Nonetheless, Pauline lasted two years on work fair until she finally got fed up one hot summer day while picking up garbage on the highway when her supervisor would not let her get a drink of water. As Pauline remembered the incident, <clears throat> she asked her supervisor for a water break, but he declined saying, it ain't break time yet. Pauline persisted. I'm hot, she recalled saying. I feel like I'm gonna faint. They even give water to thirsty dogs. Can I just have a little bit of water? He wouldn't allow it. Break time was not for another 15 minutes. Pauline went to the van to get water anyway, which, of course, her supervisor saw. As a punishment, a sort of punishment, he told her to sit down for 10 minutes, and she did, she recalled. But after that time passed, Pauline said that she got up to go back to work, because if she did not perform the labor, regardless of the reason, even if it was because he had told her to sit down, if she did not perform the labor, she would be marked as noncompliant, which was, would result in a sanction. And because it was her second offense, or it was going to be her second offense, the sanction would last 90 days. So as she got up to go back to work, Pauline remembered her supervisor saying, did I tell you to go back out there? It's been past 10 minutes, she remembered saying to him. You're going to mark down that I didn't do anything. Let me get back out there. I feel better now. 
He refused. He said, I didn't tell you that you can go back out. By then, Pauline had had enough. I was speaking my mind, she explained to me. To her supervisor, she said sassily, I'm sick of you yelling at me with your smart mouth. I'm not the one who needs this, she remembered him saying. You're the one who needs this. I get a paycheck. You know what, Pauline said? You can take that paycheck and stick it up your mm-mm. That's how she said it to me, but I think back in the day she said ass. And so, as Pauline went on to explain, and so we were back and forth until finally I said, you know what, you can kiss my ass. And so he made me sit in the van for the rest of the day. When we got back to social services, I didn't go upstairs. I didn't go sign out or nothing. I just said, y'all can have this. And I walked off. In so doing, Pauline said that she lost all of her cash benefits, her food stamps, her Medicaid. She was unemployed for eight or nine months until she and was actually homeless and kind of couch surfing across family and friends until she finally found what she considered to be a disreputable job in a bar. As she told me with disgust, I would rather work in a bar than go through that. Even though I wasn't making that much money, I wasn't being disrespected like that or treated like I'm a common piece of trash because I'm not, I'm not. For workfare workers, as Pauline and Shara describe, the threat and reality of sanctions is an everyday experience just as is solitary confinement for workfare workers. This is the power, the punitive power, under which they labor. Meanwhile, for the two university uh, student workers in the study, right, the college athletes and the graduate students in the sciences, the punitive power that their bosses wield is much less severe, though nonetheless far-reaching, and it is still punitive. For athletes, for example, if they do not comply with their coaches' directives, they will likely lose first their playing time, right? If they don't do whatever their coach tells them to do, whether that's, that may include um, not going to a mental health counseling appointment and going to practice instead, right? You can't miss practice. Maybe that includes um, majoring in sociology rather than engineering because the engineering classes conflict with your practice schedule. Or maybe that even includes playing through an injury because you have a really big game coming up this weekend, right? So if you don't comply with what your coach tells you to do, you're gonna lose your playing time. That is the chance to play your sport and likely your only chance to play your, your sport at this elite level. You can also lose professional recruitment opportunities, both because you're losing playing time, right? If you're not playing, you're not gonna get recruited, but also because of coaches' recommendations, in fact, it turns out that coaches' recommendations in college sports to professional recruiters function a lot like they do for graduate students. They are a formal gatekeeper between you and professional recruiters in terms of the recommendation. And what uh, athletes told me is that if a coach tells a recruiter that you're, quote, uncoachable, meaning you're not submissive, you don't do what they say, then you're not going to get recruited. You're not going to play for the NFL or the NBA. What they need to be is coachable submissive, do what the coach says. And finally, of course, athletes can also lose their scholarships and therefore their access to subsidized education and the accreditation it offers. So they work under a lot to lose. Now, as for all of these groups of workers, athletes held a range of views about their labor. Certainly none, not all of them felt particularly commodified or exploited. But many of them did, and a number of them, because I was interviewing former athletes, in fact, many of them described a sort of transformation from the start of their college careers where they felt incredibly lucky and excited to be there to the end of their college careers where they felt rather exploited. Now, former football player Zachary Lane was not one of those, in fact. He, his older brother, who had also been a football player, had prepared him warning against the potential for exploitation in college sports. So he went in ready. Um, and in fact, he had developed a rather cynical view of the relationship between college football players and their coaches and the NC2A. So as he explained to me, as Zachary said, the NC2A is, quote, <clears throat> just a business that uses the cheapest product, i.e. college athletes, to generate revenue. And to emphasize this point, the 29-year-old African-American man developed an extended analogy between Division I college athletics and pimps, on the one hand, 
and college athletes and prostitutes on the other. In both cases, this formal football player argued, those with power sell a dream and promise glamour in order to recruit and ultimately exploit their targets. As Zachary explained, <clears throat> a pimp might recruit prostitutes by saying, oh yeah, now he's, stuck. he's talking here. Oh yeah, we're gonna bring you over here. We're gonna make you look nice. We're gonna get you all dressed up. You like wearing that nice stuff, don't you? Yeah, you look good. You look really good. And what do the college coaches tell you? He said, oh man, yeah, I think you should come and play right away for us. Don't you look good in this jersey? Look at our facilities. This is real nice here, right? Look at our lockers. Look at our cleats. Now for an 18-year-old kid, Zachary said, you're like, oh yeah, I like this. This is nice. But when you get here, it's just work, just like the woman. I mean, she might like to have sex already. And if she does, that's even better because I don't have to break your mind now. You're going to do this anyways. Like for me, I'm gonna play football anyways. I might do it for free, but really I'm paying for my education. Just like the woman is having sex with these men, getting this money, bringing it back to the pimp, to the NC2A or to the university, right? She's bringing the money back to daddy. She's getting taken care of and it all looks good. Oh, that's my favorite employee, the pimp says. I love you, I'm gonna take care of you. I'm gonna make sure everything is good. You're hurt? Okay, I'll take care of your doctor's bill. You go to jail, I'm gonna bail you out. I'm gonna take care of you. But as Zachary went on to explain to me, both prostitutes and college athletes are at risk of quote, getting used up. If they're done with you, they're done with you, he said. And he was only able to avoid this fate, he explained to me, because his older brother had warned him against getting quote, pimped. And so what that meant for him is that he made sure to get what he needed out of college football football, which for him was to get to the NFL, which he did, and to leave with his education, which he did. So he believed strongly from the outset to avoid getting pimped. But it was a real fear that he would be exploited in this way. <clears throat> Interestingly, at least in my view, and it's a little surprising, in fact, faculty advisors actually wield similar dimensions of power over their graduate students. So as I mentioned at the outset, I studied in particular science graduate students. These are students who labor in their advisor's labs um, over the course of their educational careers, right, getting their PhDs, but their advisor owns all of the products of their labor, right? It is their advisor's research. And the graduate students and the postdocs are the ones who are in the labs doing that research, executing the experience, uh, experiments. As they told me, they are the hands that perform the experience, experiments that their advisor wants. And their advisor owns all of the products of their labor, right? They own any publications that come out of it. They own any inventions or patents, any findings, their advisors own it. And it is their own research, right? If I am a, an advisor in the sciences, my tenure case, my promotion case is predicated entirely on the labor of my students. Now, but so the power that they wield over these students is uh, far-reaching. So first, of course, they determine whether graduate students stay in graduate school, right, whether they're good enough, which makes sense, and so whether they have access to this education. But they also, interestingly, determine whether students can leave. And I found over and over again, as I read in a moment, that it is apparently common practice in the sciences for graduate student advisors to delay their advisees' defense date because now they're productive workers in the lab and letting them leave is a detriment to their own research agendas. Um, so they determine whether students can stay in graduate school, whether they can leave graduate school with their degrees, whether they get a PhD at all, whether they can publish pa uh, papers, um, and of course, whether they can obtain future jobs. In the world of academia, if I just wield massive amounts of power, they are the gatekeepers, as I said before, between a graduate student and an academic job. So as I write in the book, let's see. The most basic power that science faculty have over graduate students is their ability to dismiss students from the lab, which usually dismiss, means being dismissed from school without a PhD at all. As Lane explained to me, Quote, your advisor will basically tell you whether your work is good enough or not good enough. And if they ever make that decision where you're, they're no longer going to support you, meaning that you can no longer work in their lab, that's a big black X on you. 
And to explain why this 30 year old white woman continued, quote, I'm an inorganic chemist. So if I was asked to leave, it was highly unlikely that another inorganic chemistry advisor would take me on, right? You can't just switch advisors that easily in the sciences. So as she said, I would probably have to switch to analytical or organic or a different subdivision of chemistry and then go through the entire process again, basically start graduate school again. And so if that happens, people usually leave with a master's and they're done forever. And it's unfortunate because maybe your advisor isn't the nicest person or maybe they have emotional security issues or, you know, they're all socially awkward. These are brilliant, brilliant people. And so if you don't get along with your advisor for whatever reason, they can just walk in and kick you out. Now, Ron, who is now a chemistry professor, said that although kicking students out is actually not that common, he has seen it happen. The most underhanded way I've seen it handled, this mid-30s white man said, is that when students come up to get into candidacy, the advisor speaks to the committee ahead of time and just says to them, hey, I don't want the student to pass. And then the student will be failed from their candidacy, and if you fail your candidacy, you're out of the PhD program. Yet, as I mentioned before, because of faculty reliance on graduate student labor, Ron said that there's often a disincentive for them to dismiss students, even those students whose work is not satisfactory. And because of this re reliance, he said that there's also disincentive for faculty to, to allow good students to graduate and finish their degrees and leave the lab. Faculty need their labor. Thus, in addition to being kicked out, graduate students feared the opposite, not being allowed to leave graduate school. As Ron bluntly explained, <clears throat> quote, the thing with graduate students is they're terrible, right? They're crap. They're awful in the lab, usually until their final year. And then in their final year, that's when they suddenly learn skills like time management. And they learn, oh wait, if I do two things at once, I will actually speed up the research. And so I've absolutely heard tell of advisors who have essentially prevented their students from coming up for their PhD defense because out of nowhere, they suddenly became productive. And advisors want to keep them on longer to get more production out of them. So nearly all of the former graduate students I interviewed were familiar with this practice, though most of them had not experienced it firsthand. <clears throat> but Lane did, however, and in fact, she said that it was common practice across all the labs in her department. I haven't talked to anybody where that's not the case, she said. You're trying to leave, you're trying to set up your career, you're going on job interviews, you're writing your dissertation, you're wrapping up your research, and all the while your professor is trying to squeeze every last experiment out of you. Because they've spent so much time trying to get their lab up and running, and now here you are after five years, you're finally a student that can produce work for them. So letting you leave is a detriment to their promotion. As Lane went on to explain to me, to uh, get around this issue, the students in her department developed what she called a trick. They would essentially ask their advisor to defend a semester earlier than they really wanted to defend, and push for that defense date. And their advisor would say, no, 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 too soon. But they would delay it. And as her advisor says, she was pushing for a defense date in the fall. Her advisor said, no, 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 too soon, too soon, too soon. But the spring, the spring will work. And as Lane said, OK, yeah, the spring will happen. I got it in writing, and then I was done. And then she was able to leave, get his letter of recommendation, and pursue a career. But it was only because he allowed her to do so, right? And they wheeled total unchecked power over their ability to graduate and get a job. So across all of these labor relations, of course, not all faculty advisors, coaches, caseworkers, and corrections officers deploy these punitive powers. At least they don't do so in mean-spirited ways, right? But those who do are not bad apples. They are not exceptions to the rule. They are the rule. Their access to such expansive punitive power is simply a matter of course in these labor relations. And as a result, it often remains unquestioned by workers and supervisors alike. This is just how things are done in these workplaces. If a prisoner does, do, doesn't comply with an order, he'll likely be put in solitary confinement. If a workfare worker does not adhere to her supervisor's directives, she will likely be sanctioned. If an athlete does not comply with his coach's dictates, she will likely lose playing time or her scholarship could be revoked and she could lose access to her education. And if a graduate student does not follow his advisor's directives, he will likely lose or may very well lose his advisor's support for future employment. His whole career is at stake. 
Thus, I argue that all of these workers labor under the threat of punishment. Whether or not they experience such punishment firsthand, they are acutely aware of the punitive power that their supervisors can wield. And this awareness pervades the workplace, fundamentally shaping their actions and experiences. Thank you. I'm happy to take questions now. That was wonderful, Erin, thank you. Um, and um, we, we don't have any questions yet, so um, uh, maybe I'll, I'll start us off, but um, please, uh, if you have a question, um, uh, throw it in the, uh, in the chat there. Um, uh, yeah, I, I wrote down a few questions. I'm, I'm really interested in, in this uh, research that you've done, and I'm, I'm wondering, um, was there anything that particularly surprised you um, uh, while, while you were uh, working on the book? And I'm, I'm wondering also, like, if you kind of had these four groups um, uh, targeted um, at the start of the concept of the book and, and kind of, um, yeah, how, how the idea came to you? Yeah, okay, so I'll take those in reverse order. Um, okay. No, I did not start out with these groups in mind specifically. So I originally wanted to study workers who are unprotected by labor and employment laws to different degrees. So my original research design did include at one end of the spectrum incarcerated workers who are not covered by virtually any labor and employment law in the middle, workfare workers who have some modest protections, technically in a kind of convoluted way, they should be getting minimum wage, but only if you include their SNAP benefits. Um, <clears throat> and then at the other end of the spectrum, I was gonna study domestic workers, people who work in people's homes, nannies, uh, mm -hmm. caretakers, and so on. But as I set out, so I started with incarcerated and then workfare workers, and through those interviews, the, as I mentioned a little bit at the beginning of my talk, the power dynamics really came to the fore. And the fact that they weren't protected by law is certainly kind of the scaffolding for those power dynamics, but that's not how they experienced their work. It was the power, the punitive power that their bosses wielded that really became the central focus, of, that was the central focus of their experience and therefore came the central focus of my book. And then I also went on to interview domestic workers. Um, and they just were the same. They didn't experience the same power dynamics. Now, that doesn't mean that they're not vulnerable and often marginalized in the workplace, um, but it wasn't the same. And so that really pushed me to kind of figure out what I was studying, what I was finding, what, what type of power this was, and why domestic workers didn't fit in. Because in point of fact, if you read the literature on domestic work, you might expect otherwise. You might, in fact, that they believe that they are very vulnerable to their boss's power. Um, and I realized through this kind of convoluted process that that's often because domestic workers in major cities are often immigrants. And so their bosses, especially if they're undocumented or if they're here on um, guest worker visas, their bosses essentially hold power over whether they are a worker in America or deported. Right, or essentially criminalized and to be deported. That is the, exactly the type of power that I'm studying in this book. But the domestic workers I interviewed in Western New York, where I live, all but one were native born. And so they did not experience that dimension of power. And so I came to see that the power dynamics that I'm talking about may characterize domestic work, but largely for those who are not native born and are fearful of or vulnerable to deportation over which their bosses have a great deal of power. So through that, that helped me understand what I was studying. It really helped me kind of clarify it analytically. And so then I start casting about for different groups of workers. I wanted them to, I wanted some variation across them to be different in other ways. And so ultimately I came to the two student groups. Um, I do remain surprised that they all kind of fit together so well. I really do think that they experience the same type of coercion um, though obviously to very different degrees. And I guess the most surprising thing, I mean, I'm an academic, I'm a faculty advisor, I have graduate students. Um, so one of the most surprising things though for me was what I talked about in the talk was that in the sciences, it is relatively common practice for advisors to squeeze labor out of their students and prevent them from graduating with a degree to do so. Yeah. Um, uh, I have a, a question that is coming from Lulu. Oh, thank, thank you for answering that, that question, by the way, Aaron. Um, I have a question um, from Lulu, which is, um, I recently heard that prisoners in California are being used in fighting wildfires. 
and that um, their exposure to COVID-19 has weakened them leading up to the fires. Uh, do you know much about this and do you have a take? Um, so I don't know specifically about the relationship between exposure to, I don't know if anyone knows about kind of the immediate and recent exposure to COVID and fighting firefighters. If they have been exposed, which many, 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 we do know that many prisoners have been, um, then they are almost certainly at, at even greater risk on the fire lines, right? Um, it is absolutely the case that the state of California uses um, nonviolent offenders in fire camps. This is one of the jobs that they are offered. They get higher pay for doing so. Many people conceive of this as a good thing um, and that, they're, that they see it as a choice. I do not see it as a free choice for these prisoners. Um, being paid a dollar a day or maybe even a dollar an hour while you're fighting an active fire is um, behind bars. It's a coercive choice. It's a Hobson's choice, right? Between nothing and not much of anything. Um, and so, and it, it's quite dangerous work. They are, um, they have higher rates of injury and death than typical firefighters. And importantly, they don't have access to firefighting jobs when they get out of prison. So um, I, you know, I'm not against incarcerated labor in theory, right? I do think that incarcerated people like everyone else should have access to rights bearing dig dignified work, but um, we're not seeing that in the fire camps necessarily. Yeah, and, and um, uh, I'm certainly no expert in this, but I think what, what I had been reading, I think is that some of the prisons are, are on lockdown because of the coronavirus um, so, sort of as a preventative. And, and, and that's the reason that they're, they're not allowed to, uh, to, to leave, but, but I, I'm not positive about that. Um, I'm, I'm wondering um, uh, what, um, what was your process like um, in terms of reaching out to people, um, specifically um, inmates? And, and, and um, yeah, I, I imagine there's some reluctance to, to speak with you. And um, I'm just wondering if you could speak a little bit about that. Yeah, so for each of these groups, you know, this research took me like six years at least. Um, for each of the groups, I kind of had to reinvent the wheel to figure out how I was going to talk to them. Um, for prisoners, I originally intended to go into New York State prisons and interview um, people there. And I got IRB approval, that's the institutional approval that we all have to get and so on, and that was all fine. And then the New York State prison system said, no way. And they said, quote, your research will not benefit us, so you can't come in. Um, so that was a non-starter. So I ultimately um, got connected to formerly incarcerated people, so people who are recently in prison, from prisons across New York State specifically. Um, and I got to them through a variety of different organizations. So it actually turns out that they are one of the easier groups to get to from a recruitment uh, wise because they are sent to a lot of reentry programs. So, and so through reentry re programs, I got access to this population and I would just give my spiel. And in fact, I found that they were incredibly eager to share their experience. Um, they were very, very willing to talk, as were workfare workers. In fact, most of the workfare workers I interviewed, not all of them, but most of them were currently working as a workfare worker. And I was, you know, very careful. I said, this is not going to affect your employment in any way, your access to welfare. And they were very uh, ready to share their experiences. Um, interestingly, however, the two student groups, they were, um, so both of those were regional and New York state based. And I just, I went to organizations, I went to advocacy organizations, but most of the workfare workers, I actually showed up at their sites and asked to interview them. Um, the two student groups, I did not interview any students that were affiliated with my own university. I was very concerned with privacy and confidentiality and anonymity. Um, and so that was like a very slow process of what we call snowball sampling, like friends of friends of friends of friends getting to a diverse group of people. They had attended schools um, across the US within the past five or so years. Um, and that was just slow and tedious getting, you know, talking, finding enough people who, um, oh, and I was gonna say about the two student groups, whereas the uh, um, prisoners and workfare workers who are quite vulnerable and at risk of many things, um, they were not as concerned in talking to me as the two student groups were. And I think that's, a, so even though some of the athletes had left their sport altogether, or maybe some of them were playing in the professional leagues, they were very wary 
about talking about their coaches and their athletic programs, as were the graduate students. The former graduate students are very wary. And they said to me, look, you can never burn bridges in this field. It's very dangerous to do that. And so I think because their bosses, their former bosses, control their future careers in both of those cases, um, they still really feel that power hanging over them. And they were worried about talking to me. And in fact, one of the graduate students that I talked to was so scared um, that I really didn't, I didn't use any of her words. I didn't quote her at all in my book um, because she was just, she, I mean, she said I could, but I didn't feel comfortable because she was so nervous. Well, um, thank you uh, for that. And um, I have a new question that's coming from Scott. Um, Scott says, I wonder how unusual the case studies you mentioned really are. Uh, I see most jobs in the U.S. that are at will as laboring under the construct that workers are free to not work um, or leave work whenever they want. But in reality, workers are rarely truly free to make those decisions because they need to support their families. Uh, so in reality, they're forced to work under terrible conditions. So the question is, do you think there's an enormous amount of coercion in ordinary workplaces? And is that of a different type from the examples that um, you've written about? Yeah, great question, Scott. So my answer is, in short, yes and yes. So absolutely the case, like as we know from Marx and way back when, like our work in a capitalist system is really defined by coercion. When you have the choice to either work or starve, that's not a real choice. It's a coerced choice. Um, and that's the type, and so we call that economic coercion, right? Because essentially the, the bosses and the system has power over your wages, your access to money, which is the only way we can survive in the system. It's a profound, and profoundly powerful form of coercion, absolutely. And all workers experience it, though to different degrees, right? The day laborer and the middle manager, they both experience it, but it's very different. So absolutely, coercion pervades workplaces. Um, so the type of coercion that I'm talking about intersects with that, but it's, I'm arguing that it's a different type. So whereas there's economic coercion where your boss has power over your wages through the ability to hire and fire you, right? Or promote you or demote you or put you on the night shift, or make you get worse, tips or whatever. For the workers in my book, and other workers too fit into this category, <clears throat> it's not that what they're concerned about is not losing their wages per se, and in fact some of them don't even have real wages, but they do have some sort of like student stipends or prisoners get measly wages or workfare workers get their cash benefits. It's not the economic coercion in as much, because they're not classified as workers, is their access to all of the other rights and privileges that comes with the status they're in. So I call it status coercion. So for example, in prison, their money is important. And so these incarcerated workers do experience this economic coercion, right? Getting your wages taken away from you is bad. But the, the solitary confinement, the key block, the tickets, those are forms of status coercion because in prison, you need to keep your status, sorry, that's noise in my attic, um, you need to maintain your status as a prisoner in good standing. You need to be a prisoner in good standing to get out for parole. You need to be a prisoner in good standing to maintain those privileges or those really basic entitlements. You need to, in order to talk to your family, in order to buy edible food, in order to buy basic toiletries from the commissary, in order to be able to go to the recreation yard, right? You need to be a prisoner in good standing. All of these things come with that status. And so I call this type of coercion status coercion. It certainly overlaps and intersects with economic coercion, but I'm saying it's a different type. Thank you, thank you Aaron, and thank you, Scott, for that question. Um, uh, I'm wondering um, if, uh, if there are, um, uh, what can be done about this in short? Um, are there, are there how, how can these laborers um, uh, fight back or, um, you know, for, for the rights and, and, and for the, um, yeah, for to, to not to not suffer um, a punishment that that maybe they shouldn't. Yeah, it's a good question, and you know, I think in as in any instance, there are little and big changes at a very very basic level. Like some of these systems need complete overhauls, right? Uh, um, so I'll start with that. Um, but aside from a complete revolution of our criminal justice system, um, at the most basic level, what we need is something like a robust HR department in each of these institutions. I mean, the, as one former graduate student tell me, told me, she was like, it's the wild, wild west in the sciences. It, your experience as a graduate student, how much you learn, how much you are able to do, how you're treated, 
whether you get a job, everything depends on your advisor. And there's no check on your advisor's power, right? So is this, this is not only that, that all these bosses wield this power, it's that there's no check on the power. There's no one looking over coaches' um, backs, making sure that they treat their workers well. There's no one breathing down faculty advisors next to make sure that they're treating their workers well as workers, right? Interestingly, in the prison system and in welfare, there are technically grievance procedures in place um, that really came out of the prisoner rights and welfare rights movements of the 70s. But as one former prisoner told me, he was like, yeah, you can file a grievance, but you're grieving to the same people who grieved you. Um, so there's still, there are just not robust mechanisms in place that at least put checks on the power. So that's a basic start. Thank you. Thank you, Erin. Although I guess I will say to speak to your worker mobilization issue, I mean, one, one interesting thing, we are seeing some mobilization now with athletes. And, and we have seen over the past several years with graduate students as well. I think one interesting point is that could come out of this analysis is recognizing that these two students groups, which often don't meet, except for maybe in the classroom with graduate students as TAs, that they have a lot in common. Um, they're both student workers in similar positions of vulnerability, um, that they could potentially unite or at least support each other in their mobilization efforts. Um, but because of the kind of the power under which they labor, they also, when they do mobilize, when they do organize and make demands, as we've seen athletes doing in, in the COVID crisis, they do so at great risk. Um, but we are seeing that more and more in this moment of crisis. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Erin. Um, and, uh, and thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, we've been uh, discussing coerced work under threat of punishment um, with Erin Hatton. Um, I just dropped the link in uh, the chat. You can buy the book from Booksmith and we'll send it right to you. Um, we're offering free shipping throughout San Francisco and uh, the East Bay. Um, this was the fourth in a six event series with UC Press. It continues every Monday uh, for the next two weeks. Um, next week, we'll be joined by Sarah Jacquette Ray to discuss her book, A Field Guide to Climate Anxiety, How to Keep Your Cool on a Warming Planet. Um, I'll drop that link um, uh, in the chat now, along with uh, a link for um, uh, both that and the, and the following event with Joe William Trotter Jr. Um, uh, thank you again for joining us. Um, I hope we can all meet uh, together in person um, in the near future, but uh, until then, please uh, take care and, and, and stay well, everyone. Thank you again, Erin.